originally the plan was that um, uh, the talk that I just gave, the lecture I just gave, was going to be the end of one day. Oops. Oh, yes. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. 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 Okay, okay. Thank you very much. Um, there we go. Okay. So um, originally the plan was going to be that the lecture I just gave was going to be the end of one day, and this was going to be the beginning of the next day. Um, so therefore, I am now reviewing what we went over yesterday. Anyway, um, I'll, I'll go through this quite quickly. Again, we're looking at the simplest possible um, differential equation concerning the um, evolution of a probability distribution in time. Um, example being the dynamics of a Turing machine, digital gate in a circuit. These examples I'm giving now compared to the ones I gave um, an hour ago, these are getting much, much closer to computer science. Ligand receptors in the cell membrane sensing an external medium. Um, organelles in the cell interacting with one another, and so on and so forth. Um, again, uh, recall that we've um, decomposed the time derivative of the Shannon entropy into an entropy flow rate, an entropy production rate. Um, and physically, uh, um, I said, I didn't actually derive, that this right here, um, uh, the entropy flow rate, that um, is arising from, uh, in thermodynamic scenarios, a system of interest, an SOI, exchanging energy with one or more baths, and that this um, actually implicitly assumes a bath is infinite with a separation of time scales, as I mentioned. Um, uh, tomorrow, actually, Goger will be presenting the version of uh, th stochastic thermodynamics when you've got a finite bath, so that this doesn't apply and you actually don't even have a Markov chain. But in any case, when you do have this kind of a situation, which is the standard assumption in equilibrium statistical physics, that you've got an infinite bath and you have what's called separation of time scales, um, what this means, loosely speaking, is that the bath is always um, thermalizing. The bath is always itself at a thermal equilibrium. The heat bath is at thermal equilibrium. And it's always getting back to that equilibrium much, much faster than the evolution of your system of interest itself. The end result being that if the bath is always at thermal equilibrium, it has no information in it about its previous interactions with the system of interest. So that's what allows the evolution of the state of the system of interest to be formulated, modeled as a Markovian process. If there were not a separation of time scales, if the bath were going through its dynamics only at the same time, at the same speed with which the system of interest is, then even if the bath were infinite, it wouldn't matter. The state of the bath would provide you with some information about its earlier interactions with the system of interest. So therefore, the current state of the system of interest would be telling you something about the state of the bath. The state of the bath will be telling you something about the previous state of the system of interest. So the current state of the system of interest would actually reflect um, earlier states of the system of interest, which violates the Markovian dynamics assumption. So that's a very hand-wavy kind of an intuition for why separation of time scales is necessary for us to be able to assume Markovian dynamics. Um, uh, when we are actually in this kind of a thermodynamic view of things. All right, okay. And as um, uh, we went through last time, we went through the proof of it. The entropy production rate is now negative, and I argued that that is, basically I would say argued that rather than prove that, that that's the second law of thermodynamics, at least for these kinds of situations where you have Markovian dynamics. We then uh, integrate over time, and we saw that um, uh, the distribution go from P0 to P1, that this is the uh, total, this gives you um, Landauer's bound, that the actual um, entropy flow um, uh, can be written as the difference between the entropy production and the change in entropy. Um, one subtlety to note, so now we're starting to get into some new things. Delta S only depends on the initial and ending distributions. 
anything is allowed in between the two. That is not true for either the heat flow or the entry production. So for example, in bit erasure, the drop in entropy is KT log 2 if you had a uniform initial distribution. What is going on for the heat flow and the entropy production depends completely on the way that you implement that bit erasure. That's the difference between a semi-static evolution um, uh, when you are racing a bit versus something that's um, horribly messy and inefficient with all kinds of turbulence. Okay? Um, good. Mm, approximate. Okay. So now um, I'm going to be generalizing this. In lots of um, physical systems, your um, system of scenarios, your system of interest is not actually connected to a single bath. It can be connected to multiple particle reservoirs. Um, a heat engine is, um, at a minimum, is connected to two baths, a hot one and a cold one. It's the difference between those two temperatures that actually makes it a heat engine. But everything I was doing before, it wasn't clear where that would be coming in, the fact that you have multiple reservoirs, they're sometimes called. Here is how to do it. What we do is we um, index all the reservoirs, all the baths, with, by this um, V. V is just the symbol that I'm using here. And we, and we, make, we change the, um, uh, basically, we decompose the rate matrix, the global rate matrix, to a sum over all the reservoirs of reservoir-specific rate matrices. Okay? The intuition is going to be that each reservoir wants to push the system to be in a particular state that's appropriate for that reservoir. So for example, a heat bath at temperature T is going to want to push the system to be in equilibrium, the Boltzmann distribution, for that particular temperature T. If you have another bath that's connected to your system at a temperature T prime, it's going to be wanting to push the system to be in a Boltzmann distribution for temperature T prime. It's the sum of those two pushes, so to speak, that's giving you your overall actual rate matrix that's governing the system. The system has got two masters in that particular case. And that is being reflected here in the fact that we have a sum over reservoirs. OK, so um, yep, OK, that's everything good, all good. All good. OK, so physically, what is the entropy flow? I've said a bunch of times that it is the um, uh, heat flows, but let's see if we can decompose that and actually put a little bit more flesh on that statement. So, and by the way, I am trying to rush to, and I'm not going to be able to make it in just 10 minutes, but um, uh, hopefully it'll be not too much longer than that. So anyway, here's the same question. What is the um, entropy flow? Here is where physics is coming in. We're going to be assuming that the underlying microdynamics is time reversal invariant. This is what is called local detailed balance. Local because it's reservoir specific. If you um, have heard the phrase detailed balance before, this is the formula for the um, equilibrium state of a system if there were just a single reservoir and it obeys detail balance. It's basically saying that at that equilibrium, the uh, total flow between a, a state J and a state I of probability is zero. That there's no probability going, um, net probability going in either direction. Local detail balance says that that's got to be true for each reservoir separately. Each reservoir separately is connecting physically to the system with a particular interface that doesn't know anything about other interfaces. And so just that one particular reservoir would send you to be at equilibrium um, for its particular temperature and so on and so forth. It obeys um, detail balance, and therefore all of them separately obey detail balance. OK, does that make sense to people? OK. So, um, as I said, the uh, stationary states for each of the um, separate um, reservoirs is just a Boltzmann distribution here. I've extended it to allow for chemical potentials. And then what you see, when you plug this in, 
that the heat flow term right here for this particular case, it ends up being this expression. It's the temperature of that particular reservoir. Um, uh, and we can just, if we ignore the chemical potential terms, it's just the temperature times the energy times the rate of change of the probability of that particular state. So what the heat flow is, is the change in probability is the K times P term of the total energy of the system. If I were to write the total energy of the system, sum over states I, this is the expected energy of the system at some times T. Um, expected energy. So therefore, the time derivative It's going to be two terms this one is the heat flow it's the because this right here p dot remember this battery's dead again remember p i dot that is this um, uh, Kp right there for that particular reservoir. So this summed over all, so this right here, Pi dot, remember, decomposing. Um, I forget my precise notation, something like this. So the entropy flow term is the first term where you are having the energy levels fixed and you are changing the probability distribution. Physically, what's going on is you're exchanging energy with that particular reservoir. That exchange of energy is changing your state you are in. It's not changing the energy levels of the states. It's changing the state that you're in. And that's what entropy flow is. That's what it means. That's what the local detail balance is all about. This term right here, you've actually, you're, what you're considering is for a fixed probability distribution, what is the actual time, what is the consequence if the energy levels of each state are changing? Can anybody guess what this corresponds to in a standard physics system? Well, you're not, a, trying, you're not changing the probability distribution but you're changing the energy levels of the various states. Yep, this is, what's, this is work. This is if you've got an external work reservoir, and there's all kinds of subtleties as to how you would actually model a work reservoir. Typically, it's an infinite system as well, um, the details there. But basically, the work reservoir causes this term for the change of the expected energy. All other reservoirs, which just involve exchanges of energy or of particles or things like that. These are exchanges of energy or particles, fluctuations. This is very often taken as a deterministic change. No fluctuations, no exchanges. This is like changing a magnetic field on a system or something like that. So assuming we're not down at the level of quantum field theory, there's nothing being exchanged under the particular circumstances. Okay, so notice also that here that each, um, in the heat flow term, it's the sum over reservoirs of uh, beta soup reservoir. So if you have multiple reservoirs um, at different temperatures, then this is going to be the sum over those reservoirs of the, over the heat flow terms. Okay. Um, let's see. So now let's return to the uh, lower bound, which was um, just Landauer's bound in the case of a single reservoir, temperature Kt, and just two states and so on. But now we can talk about multiple reservoirs, and let's just say that, in it, that so the Kt is not even defined. So as soon as you're talking about multiple reservoirs, we can't even talk about something like, oh, bit erasure is Kt log 2. There's no T. There's multiple reservoirs. Um, let's um, kick it up, allow an arbitrary number of states, arbitrary initial distribution, Arbitrary dyna um, dynamics, P of ending state given um, starting state. Let's assume that local detail balance does hold. 
Then the entropy flow is, as we just saw here, temperature normalized heat flow into the reservoirs. That's what this thing is. EP is non-negative, so therefore we get the generalized Landauer's bound. That the temperature normalized heat flow into the reservoirs is greater than or equal to the drop of entropy. Where you can't have any KTs around because you don't even have a single T. Okay, that, and this is a, you'll, you'll see that phrase generalized Landauer's bound. Um, often in the uh, literature referring to this result. Okay, dependence of EP on the initial distribution. Um, hold on, let me just take a look, think about this. Um, there's actually a lot of non-trivial material here, and I think it's important material as well. Um, Let's tomorrow, if this is okay with yeah. you, I'll start going over the dependence of EP initial distribution. The basic idea behind what's the rest of all this material is that everything in stochastic thermodynamics conventionally, everything that I've presented to you so far, considers the following um, uh, scenario from a high level. We know that here is the initial distribution of the um, state of the system. We want to now analyze, investigate what happens if we change the dynamics of the process that then operates on that initial distribution. So for example, can we achieve Landauer's bound with bit erasure? And there's similar things with Maxwell's demon and so on. And if I've got some distribution over possible states of a um, ligand receptor in a cell, um, depending on how the ligand actually works, its process, you will get different kinds of stochastic thermodynamics. In many situations, it's not the initial distribution that's fixed and you, the scientist, are getting to vary the process. Very often, it's the process that's fixed, but the initial distribution is varying. So, for example, if I'm building my computer, it's got a whole bunch of digital gates in it. A whole bunch is actually a real big, big number, by the way. Those gates, all those AND gates in this computer, they are actually all running the therm same thermodynamic process. They just all came out of a fab somewhere in Taiwan. And they're all pretty much, um, for all intents and purposes, identical physical systems. But the initial distribution over the inputs to all of those AND gates is going to be very, very different from one another every time that this computer is run. They're all in very, very different um, uh, uh, positions, so to speak, within the configuration of the entire information flow through the computer. So the question for this computer really is, if I have the same fixed physical process, what are the consequences of varying the initial distribution Rather than saying, if I've got a fixed initial distribution, what are the consequences of varying the process, which is where physics has mostly been focused? This is also true a lot in, in biology. I could, so to speak, design a paramecium so that it's running a particular process which is optimized for some initial distribution of states of its environment. But if I then actually take that paramecium and drop it in a different pond, it's now in a different environment, same paramecium or offspring of that paramecium or what have you, but it's now got a different initial distribution of nutrients and so on in its environment that it must be operating on. What are the consequences when you just have a fixed system and change the distribution? Okay, just as an analogy, I think might be, like it might be helpful. I also didn't think about this before, but yeah, when we gave the lectures like in order. So for example, in information theory, one of the things that we discussed was the channel capacity and cost problem and rate distortion problem. And if you remember, the questions that we asked include approaches like, you fix the channel, right? 
for example, the channel is the same, the sort of inherent noise in the channel is, it's not changing, but what you're trying to do in this channel capacity cost problem is to find this initial source distribution, P of X, that maximizes the channel capacity. So it's actually like really, really, really close problems, but now, um, okay, two days ago we discussed this in realm of information theory. Now we are taking that same problem, expanding it for the physical systems where we can use stochastic thermodynamics. Okay, so they're all, all so closely related. Yeah, all of computer science and information theory, all these questions are all about fundamental bounds on the resource costs. And to just give you a very, very quick teaser on what the end result will be, it's that if you change the uh, distribution, so there's every process, every physical process has an initial distribution which results in minimal EP for that process. In general, that's not going to be like an edge. It's going to be something with full support. Let's say that's Q0. So I give you a physical system, an AND gate, a paramecium, what have you. There is some initial distribution over its states which will result in that process generating minimal entry production. But let's say I instead put it in a situation where it's got an initial distribution P0 rather than Q0. Focusing um, on what Gilda was just saying, building on what she was just saying, recall that information theory, relative entropy, Kolbach library divergence, is all about what is the extra expected code length if you actually use a code that's optimized for a distribution Q0, but use it with a distribution P0. Here is a similar thing, but we're not looking at code length. We're saying that Q0 is actually the distribution that results in minimal EP, but I'm instead using P0. We evolve both of them through time through the exact same process. So P0 evolves through this process to P1, Q0 evolves to Q1. The, then what happens is that this, by using P0 rather than Q0, there is an extra term in your entropy production. Notice that this is completely independent. All the details of the process are buried in this map from P0, Q0 to P1, Q1. Nothing else matters. This, by what's called the data processing inequality for Kullback library divergence, is always greater than or equal to zero. So if I take an AND gate that's got, let's see, a possible, I don't know, four possible um, inputs, and I optimize it for some, and it's, it was made in the fab to be resulting in minimal entry production for a distribution over its inputs, that's whatever, one-third, one-third, um, uh, one-quarter, and one-twelfth, I guess. But then I'm actually putting it in a place in the, my computer where it's actually getting an initial distribution over um, the, uh, the states that's different from that. Say it's one quarter, one quarter, one quarter, one quarter. That's going to result in extra heat. That AND gate is going to get hotter by an amount that's just given by this drop in KL divergence. The details don't matter. It's an AND gate, so we know what that map from P0 to P1 is. It's you're doing an AND operation. So we know what that map is. So however that AND gate works, it's going to actually encounter this much extra heat. So that's a, um, a teaser, so to speak, for tomorrow. I'll, I'll try to I'll derive that, actually. Um, it's not too hard to actually do so. Please. Okay. So again, just continuing with this kind of an analogy. So we know that, for example, in information theory, we emphasize that you have an object that you want to encode, and you can encode it by using, you know, like this entropy, like in uh, entropy is like a quantifier of the amount of the bits that you need to use to encode that object, right? But we also say that if you assume that the underlying distribution of that object is not P, but it's Q, which is like a wrong, incorrect distribution, you need to pay with a mismatch cost of a KL divergence. But it was one term of a KL divergence. Now we, we had it actually on the slide. Yeah, now we have two terms of a KL divergence. So when you try to encode an object, what you're doing is rather static, right? You're just considering one sort of like mismatch term at one time, KL divergence term, it's like one term. But what we are having here is actually more than just encoding 
that is used for communication, but you're running a process, you're computing, so you have two terms of KL divergence. Okay, so I think this is also sort of like strengthening this analogy, but also sort of uh, underlining the difference between just encoding for communication and running a process for computation. Yep, and building on this very good point and building on that, remember this morning I said that um, computation is information transformation, not just information transmission. Exactly along the lines of the uh, good point that Gilja was just making, this we saw in her review, um, that is the kind of thing you get for information transmission when you happen to be off in the way that you've designed your channel. This difference is um, a, a somewhat analogous cost. It's entry production rather than um, expected code length that you run into when you're actually doing transformation. Okay? So let's end it there. Coffee's upstairs and one can never get too much coffee. Thank you, everybody.